Hello? Oh, great, it works. My name's Harrison Wolf, and I appreciate you all being here. I, am, I lead the Drones in Tomorrow's airspace team out of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in San Francisco, where our uh, drone-related policy work, uh, tech governance, uh, frameworks development is based out of for the whole global network of uh, Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. Today, we have a panel that I'm really excited about. Um, voices from civil society, manufacturers, service providers, and government ministers, and we're brought together uh, and moderated by Akiko. Uh, and, I, and I just want to say thank you for your interest, your participation, and if at any time you want to follow up on the discussions you hear today, I encourage you to reach out to me, um, and I know the panelists are very friendly and would love to talk drones uh, or autonomous mobility uh, on digital infrastructure. So with that, I will hand it over to Akiko, and I look forward to hearing all of your questions and your interests related to our panel. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to see a packed room. Uh, here's certainly a lot of interest. Uh, I'm Akiko Fujita, I'm an anchor uh, over at CNBC International. I anchor Squawk Box Asia out of Hong Kong. Uh, certainly this sector or this uh, topic is one that uh, we discuss uh, in a lot of ways. And I know many of you have been attending a lot of panels here so far that have really uh, explored the fourth industrial revolution, this increasing push towards digitization, automation that's really disrupting so many sectors. In the best case scenario, this is something that will lead to a better way of life, uh, certainly uh, extending uh, outreach. But what we've also seen is the technology advancing so quickly that the regulation hasn't necessarily kept up. And so uh, that's one area we're really hoping to explore today um, as it relates to dr drones. Uh, of course, we've seen an increasing number of unmanned vehicles um, being deployed for delivery, you know, humanitarian aid, data collection. And we've got a, a great panel here to, to break it down. So I'd love to introduce them first. Uh, to the very end of the stage there, we've got Sonia Betchart, who is the co-founder of We Robotics. Uh, to her right is Michael Delagarde, who's the founder and CEO of Dell Air Tech. Uh, in the middle of the stage, we've got Yana Rosenbaum, who is a senior vice president, head of unmanned aerial systems, Airbus Defense and Space. and to my immediate left here, we've got uh, Lokesh Nara, who is the Minister of Information Technology, uh, Panchayat Raj, I hope I got that right, Rural Development of Andhra Pradesh, uh, which is of course the southeast part of India. So it's great to have you all. I'd love to start with an opening round of questions here. Um, uh, as it stands right now, how far along are we um, from seeing the full potential of drones, seeing this vision that's been laid out and uh, to the broader question, which use of drones are you seeing the greatest adoptions and success? I'll start with you. So from, st from a great country like India, we're just seeing drones adop uh, being adopted across the nation. I think the more use is coming in rural India. So that's where if you look at my ministry, right? I mean, I'm handling IT on one extreme and rural development on the other extreme. So we are now using drones to do very interesting projects. I'll give a few examples. One is how can I use drones to do real-time soil testing? And this is a project we're working with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The other project that we're now working on is how do I keep a track of my road quality? So we're using LiDAR-based drones to map out the entire state road uh, network and give real-time feedback for us, even from a budgeting standpoint. So this is where, you know, I think now drones is like aviation 4.0. I mean, you've seen the first uh, revolution was the first fl uh, you know, flight took off, but then came the jet engine. Like this, I think drones will play a very, very important and critical role. And emerging countries uh, like India can actually leapfrog and use this technology uh, to go to a logical conclusion. Um, I think today we're really right at the beginning. I think we're still in a extremely volatile, extremely fragmented market. And we see um, a lot of activity in the sense of many, many startups popping up and many, many startups also going bankrupt as well. And we haven't had that degree of consolidation yet that leads to this market then maturing. So I would say we're still away from what I call the tipping point uh, that tipping point is obviously linked to challenges that you mentioned already around regulations. And there are a number of other challenges where we as a business 
you know, still need to have that economic model in place. And clearly, it's an economic model that in the, the fourth industrial revolution that we're in today is very closely linked to scaling. And no real drone business today has that scaled effect yet, which makes it so challenging. And that's, again, linked to the fragmented market and it's linked to the regulatory situation. So I think we're in a very, very exciting market, but a very, very immature market that's just waiting to hit that tipping point, and that's really when the benefit of drones is going to kick in, and I think that's, that's when we're going to see it, and that's when people are really going to get excited. Yes, so uh, the, the full potential of drones is, uh, is, is, is unlimited. It's only limited by the power of imagination. Uh, I, I agree with that. <coughs> Um, we, th there is, um, we, we are at the very beginning of developing that market. Uh, uh, at Dolaire, the, the, the company I, uh, I, um, I founded, uh, we are in the market of, digit, of remote sensing. So that's kind of the, the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with drones, but that's uh, the market that you know, evolved uh, qu quite fast and that is a, a quite kind of a mature market right now. So it, it consists of you know, uh, equipping a UAV with a camera and sending that camera over long distances and collecting data uh, in order to digitize the real world and come back with a, uh, like an accurate image of, of whatever you want to observe. So this market has, you know, uh, well, it's quite, it's quite developed right now. I would say it's halfway. Uh, what we are uh, doing now is, uh, is, uh, is, is really useful for many industries in construction, in, uh, in uh, infrastructures, in agriculture, in surveillance. I think we are halfway right now. We can only you know, fly drones uh, in the limit of the visual sight of, uh, of a pilot. So this is a very strong limitation. Uh, we would like to, of course, to, uh, to, uh, to lift or to, to erase that kind of limitation to be able to fly uh, drones totally autom autonom uh, autonomously. <laughs> And um, so uh, this, this will come in time. I think uh, regulations have done a very nice job so far. Uh, about six years ago, it was totally uh, impossible or forbidden to use drones in commercial conditions. And now you can already do a number of jobs. And, and so we are halfway to, uh, to, to those situations that we, we expect in the end. To add on and not repeat what my colleague said, I agree with all of you, is uh, so from our point of view, we, we robotics, we address uh, bringing drones to emerging markets. So as Lokesh said before, I think, you know, if you look at this, even emerging markets, we're not even at the beginning, which is starting out. And uh, what I see is drones is a lot of time, like if you look at mobile phones, it doesn't need infrastructures that are needed for many other things. And in a lot of the emerging markets, drones are very interesting because they can um, produce data where there has been no data before and where data is not affordable or uh, accessible in other ways. So I believe that we're just starting out and the challenge we see in these markets, and I understand the industry because I come from the industry side before I do this, is it's markets that are too fragmented, that are too small, that are not interesting for the industry. So the challenge is to say, so what do we do? Do we wait until the industry is at the point where they will invest in these markets? Or do we do something about it and help create capacity in these emerging markets where drones could possibly even be a bigger market than up north, but it's a more fragmented market because it will need to cover local needs and this needs to be addressed in a very local way. Okay, I just want to, before we get further into the conversation, just remind you all that we've got a, a mic floating around. We'd love to get your questions down the line in the discussion. So just kind of think about that as we walk through uh, this conversation. Um, I've heard many of you point out already that this is a very fragmented market. So I wonder if we can kind of break down how the market looks right now and start with the commercial applications. And Jana, I think it, it's, it's a great question for you. You know, Airbus, very familiar with the airspace, clearly. Why disrupt your own sector? I mean, there's a saying, disrupt yourself before somebody else disrupts you. And if you look at the business of Airbus, Airbus is about transporting people. We move people from A to B. We move cargo from A to B. And we're also heavily involved in the movement of data through our satellite business. So for us to look at urban air mobility or personal transport, um, unmanned personal transport, 
it's a no-brainer for us mm. uh, to get involved in that business. And I think for a fairly traditional company such as Airbus, having that innovation driving through the company is absolutely key for any big company today. I mean, any big company who's not confronting themselves with innovation, challenging themselves internally with innovation, is going to very quickly become something of the past. So I would say we view it as the core of our business. Mm -hmm. um, we do believe that um, autonomy is going to transform the aerospace industry. And um, we're taking a very progressive step towards it. We're starting firstly with remote sensing. You heard from my colleague here on the panel that this is what we can do today. It's the, the easiest entry point. We would then be looking at the next step, natural step for us would be going into the cargo drone business. It's kind of lifting the bar one level higher than what one can do today. And it's assuming that we get over some of these regulatory hurdles that we're facing. Um, and that will pave the way towards when we will finally um, be flying around in, in flying taxis, mm. which, is, uh, which is not science fiction anymore. So I would say for us as Airbus, it's something that, again, that we see as part of our core. Um, and then we really want to drive that innovation to make sure that we are constantly disrupting ourselves before somebody else comes in, does it for us. So Airbus making big bets across the spectrum, as you pointed out, from delivery drones to flying taxis. Is that all solving the same uh, solution here, which is this increased mobility and autonomy? Is that how you view it? I mean, I think for most people, the, the drive of urbanization is what's making us look up towards the sky. So we really, uh, we, have a, we have a space that can be utilized that will really alleviate the pain we're feeling today in very congested cities. So it's almost a no-brainer to say, hey, we need to go there. Um, it's just a question of how we do it. Um, and we need to be smart about it because I think it has to be a very inclusive approach. And this is something at Airbus that we do strive um, to do that in a very broad ecosystem with many, many stakeholders. Um, but it is being driven by the, the degree of urbanization we're seeing today. Another application that, that we've seen um, is uh, the use of these unmanned vehicles in uh, more humanitarian aid. And um, Sonia, on that front, uh, you know, you have been involved with that through Weeb Robotics, trying to reach areas um, that are underserved in a more cost-effective way. What kind of developments have you seen on that front? How fast has the technology accelerated over the last few years? I think the technology has been here now for some years to be used, especially for remote sensing. Um, what is not evolving as fast is adoption, because adoption has to do with education. It has to do with building local capacity, because especially in a disaster, you know, it would make no sense, and I think we have had some disasters that show that, that you actually take drones in through your international organization or an international NGO, and there's an earthquake or there's a hurricane and you come in with your drones and you just add to the tension and you add to the chaos that is already there. So these examples over the last year have shown that technology is there, but the local capacity is not there. So what we need is local drone pilots who can deploy the same day or the next day, gather data, and then help the international organizations with the data they have gathered. And you know, just I think now on the whole uh, East Coast in the US, uh, you can see in the US right after a hurricane, drone pilots come in, they're organized, they're creating data products that help to, to uh, the disaster management uh, agencies to support their work. So what really is needed today is to create that capacity locally in, in emerging markets. And what is needed is also to think about the ethical point of view. Because when you have a disaster, people are already in distress. You don't want to add additional distress to it with technology that they don't know. <laughs> so having local capacity adds to the fact that these people are locally integrated. You know, if you have an earthquake in Nepal and you have Nepalese pilots, they know how to deal with the cultural and the ethical points. But you also need certain standards so we uh, work with a code of conduct, with a code of conduct for social good that does not just take the technical points into, into view, but also the ethical points and the data points. You say, how do you fly? You need to talk to people first. And I think it brings back to what we had a discussion about yesterday too. It's a, it's a big issue today in drones and regulations when I see in the countries I work in, it's about education. It's about the policymakers are they don't know that much about drones just yet. And a lot of them are afraid. 
So to educate the general public, it has to do a lot of community engagement. It has to do with local examples. It has to be going out there, and before you do a project, you talk to people, you explain. We fly this machine, it'll take images. This is the outcome of the images, and to get people engaged very locally through education. And I think this, so for me, it would not be the technology that is missing, but it's more uh, the application and the local integration that is missing. Uh, we'll talk more about the regulation bit and some of the lessons learned on that front, but uh, Michael and Lakesh, I'd love to bring you both in. Um, you talked a bit about the applications that you've used um, in your state so far. What do you think has been kind of the more revolutionary applications that are not necessarily sort of um, incremental improvements when you thought this is a technology that we need to invest further in? So for us, uh, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, and being a new state, right, we are looking at agile governance. Mm -hmm. It's about government being proactive and not reactive. So when you want to create a, government, a government like this, this is where technology comes into place. The, the 4 IR comes into place. And drones play a very, very important role to give us real-time feedback. So there's no one project that we've used it for. We've used it across. So I've given you two examples. I can give you 10 examples. But I know the WEF three minutes will come my way. <laughs> so you know, one example I'd like to share is Kia Motors is making its largest investment into, in Andhra Pradesh. And our chief minister, Mr. Naidu, wants to monitor this project and make sure that it's, it's getting done on time. So every week a drone flies and g gives him real-time feedback on what percentage of the construction is done. The other project we're using this for is Polavaram, which is a strategically important dam. This is where we're getting a lot of real-time feedback on what's the progress every week. So as decision makers, uh, you know, as ministers, as chief minister, we have the ability to take uh, real-time decisions. So we can actually add a completely new layer of data and data-driven decision-making. Now think about this application in agriculture. Now the biggest challenge in agriculture is uh, knowing the quality of the soil. So the challenge is you take a sample, you send it to a lab, and by the time it comes back, the agri-crop cycle is done. Because in India you have small and marginal farmers. Now then take this to a drone. I mean, drone is a vehicle. We were just talking about it, just a vehicle, right? And you have uh, sensors on it that gives you real-time feedback. And then you link it with an app to the farmer. Voila, all of a sudden, it's real-time. He exactly knows the nutritional content. He knows what, what interventions he needs to do. And this can be transformative because he exactly knows the kind of nutrition that the soil needs and not overdosing his soil. So in our state, the applications have just been you know, plenty. Mm. And uh, as we've discussed, you know, we're just at that beginning point of a drone as a, as a platform and as a governance uh, platform. And we just had that beginning. Yeah. Uh, Michael's one of the first movers in the sector. You know, you've certainly seen the changes there. You kind of touched on the agriculture a bit earlier. Yeah. What are some other applications that you've seen? Absolutely, so yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that was said, was said. The technology is here. There is a couple of building, building blocks that are missing, you know, right now. Drones uh, don't know how to see and avoid other airplanes. Uh, that's what, uh, like, uh, what a pilot should do in a plane, and that, you know, is not properly done uh, by technology right now. So this is a missing building block. Uh, there is also the matter of, you know, communicating with the uh, air traffic management system to uh, to to be able to penetrate uh, into a controlled airspace. This this has to be uh, regulated and, and 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 invented, let's say. But yeah, mostly the, the technology is easy to, to, uh, to achieve. And uh, well, it, 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 there, there's no, uh, no particular barrier or, or problem in doing that. Uh, but then uh, you're right, uh, it's all about the application. And this takes a little time because well, when, when you look at what drone is, it's, ba it's basically a flying camera. And the flying camera is useless because uh, every flight you're going to collect, I don't know, 10,000 pictures. And there is absolutely no way you will in, you know, look at the picture one by one. So you need to find uh, ways like um, software components probably that will extract the useful information out, out of that data and provide it to, to an end customer to, well, uh, meet his, uh, his particular needs. And in order to do that, you've got to, to understand uh, what your customer want to achieve with that data and, and build end-to-end uh, -end solution that will have a very simplified workflow. It doesn't have to be researched every time uh, to, to provide them that, that useful information they're going to use in their daily processes. 
So we've kind of established here just the, the applications and, and how far um, this space is advanced, but the one question seems to be still regulation. Well, how do you make sure uh, all these vehicles can operate amongst e each other? And on that front, Sonia, I thought it was interesting you were talking about uh, how the turning point for you was uh, the earthquake in Nepal. You started writing the UAV code um, in Haiyan in 2013, but it was the earthquake in Nepal that really made you think we really need to start drawing up something. Can you elaborate a bit more on, on what you observed um, in the rescue efforts, uh, in, in the aftermath of that, in terms of what was in the airspace? I think, yeah, Nepal, it was just, it created a very confusing uh, moment for everybody. So for all NGOs also, because everybody comes in with their own systems. So instead of sharing and possibly having one that acquires data and shares with the others, everybody just came in. Because it was a great discovery for all the, you know, for all the agencies working there. I think the power of drones for me is that you can create your own data. Until that point, nobody in that space could create their own data. So you would rely on satellite data. And in uh, many disasters, there's no satellite data because there's clouds, there's rain, so there's just no data. So everybody was just so excited about being able to create your own data to take decisions, like you said, Lokesh, you know, based on data that will make a big difference, especially when it's urgent management. So I think everybody was just really excited and wanted to do something good, wanted to do better work, and it ended up with everybody bringing in their own drones, uh, creating that kind of confusion, and mostly just scaring the people. And I think that really was for us a turning point to see like, okay, now all, like, uh, not all, but a, a good part of the, of the like, disaster relief management agencies and NGOs and international organization, organizations have seen, like, the power of drones. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that everybody has seen it, you know, I think we need to find a way where we can not just regulate it from a technical standpoint, but also from a human standpoint. So to say, like, what are the... What are the good use cases? What are the standards? What are the code of conduct? How should I behave when I actually fly a drone? So I should talk to people before. I should take into account that I create data. So what do I do with the data? How do I collect this data? And how do I share it with others? I think these are the kind of considerations that really then came into play. Uh, Jana, I want to get your thoughts here. We, what we have seen, uh, regulation starts to take shape but in a very fragmented way. Um, what, what is, what should be the driving factor here in terms of crafting regulation that allows for the seamless movement of uh, these vehicles? I mean, uh, it's quite challenging and I think the challenge has something to do with the fact that we, we're not harmonized on a global level. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of very important regulatory bodies. We have the FAA, we have EISA. So there are a number of bodies out there doing a very important piece of work. However, if each region has its own set of regulations, then we lack this harmonization, which is really, I would say, key for creating that tipping point inside the industry. Um, I think the challenge the regulatory bodies are having is that they come from an extremely um, uh, low risk tolerance business. I mean, we're talking about securing um, the safety of people flying in the sky. So they are draconian rules that regulate that for good purpose. Um, how do you move from that onto now drones, which means you're going to have to strip it down, but at the same time, the regulatory bodies need to make sure that it's safe enough. And we're a little bit in a chicken and the egg situation because, to be quite honest, you need to develop a body of evidence from flying. That body of evidence gives confidence. That confidence gives the regulatory bodies what they need to feel that the regulations they are passing will secure safe flight. Mm. So, and we are restricted from flying because we're flying only on, you know, with under certain conditions. So it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg that we need to solve. And one of the ways we're looking at doing it is really flying in low risk zones, fly rural, fly over water, just to generate those hours of flight to try and understand the behavior of these air vehicles. Um, what can go wrong, how to prevent something going wrong, and sharing that information with the regulatory bodies. And the regulatory bodies among themselves need to harmonize. It's absolutely key that they harmonize as well. How far along are we to, to, to seeing that harmony? I wonder what you've seen in terms of the conversation that's shifted between the regulatory bodies. You know, even five years ago, uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, to even the use 
of drones or the word drones. And it seems like uh, the thinking has evolved that, look, these things are here to stay. We need to address how to do it. What would you say has been, been the shift in the conversation among the regulatory bodies? The pressure is clearly coming from the, the market. Mm. I mean, it's coming from industry because, I mean, we really pushing, I mean, you know, anyone who's in the business wants those regulations to be put into place so we can start rolling their business out. And I think there's a large section of um, uh, users that are going to benefit from it who also want to see that. So I think they, there's that push that's coming. And I mean, I'm quite encouraged to see th there's quite a strong engagement between China and EASA, the Chinese aviation authorities and EASA. I mean, we work um, as Airbus with both um, in, a, in an ecosystem together. So we work on projects jointly together, and that I find extremely encouraging because in, there's a ex natural exchange happening between the regulatory bodies together with aeronautical companies. So I think that was a very important step to me, uh, for me because I, what I see happening here in China in terms of the innovation and um, the openness to driving that forward, um, China is going to become one of the leading regions in terms of how can we utilize drones, for sure. Mm. Um, Lokesh, you know, one of the things I've, I've heard from other panelists say is that, look, on the government side of things, the, the test cases aren't necessarily there, which makes it even difficult to craft the regulation. You've already established here that um, within the state of Andhra Pradesh, you have moved forward on the technology. How do you see the public-private partnership playing out in terms of shaping the regulation that needs to come? I think that's the fundamental challenge, right? You have regulation, then you have innovation. And there's always going to be this fight between the two things. So in Andhra Pradesh, now what you're trying to attempt is to create a regulatory sandbox. So you have the policymakers, then you have the regulators, then you have the industry. So come together, let's do pilots, let's showcase what drones can come to achieve. Let's also understand the challenges. As you rightly said, you know, just, just fly, create the number of hours, we'll understand the inherent risks. And creating a very non-confrontational platform, mm. you know, where everyone's interests are, uh, you know, are guarded, I think that is going to be very, very critical. Especially, you know, going to countries where drones are not even seen, it's something very new, like what you discussed in Nepal. I mean, in India, we use drones even for, in, in weddings, for photographs, so I think we've come to accept drones as way of life. But then, no, how, the challenges around regulation is that we have to be very, very cautious. And that's where as state, you know, we are yet to get the regulation in place. But as government of India, they monitor the airspace, They've just uh, come out with a note on that. Mm. And they are being now very proactive to promote because they've seen success stories come in. But more and more as we go down this journey, right? Drone is like electricity. The applications can be anything. You could charge a car, you could charge a phone. So drones can be used for, you know, disaster relief. It can be used for mapping road quality or even for photography. So how do you monitor that, I think, and how do you regulate that is not as easy as we think it is. So I think the sandbox and environment will really make that uh, you know, meaningful. Uh, Michael, let me ask you this. Um, I was thinking about uh, this as, as Yana was talking about the challenges of regulation that, um, you know, when I was here in China, I think four years ago even, there was a discussion about the innovation that was really pushing forward here, um, especially with drones. And, you know, somebody had mentioned to me that the part of it is that with China, they, they let you go forward first and then the regulation follows. There's other countries who would say, let's stop it first and figure out how safe this is before we move forward. Does China in a way offer kind of a model or a template in terms of how, how to, to lay this out? I don't know if that's a, it's a good example, but it seems like there's two fronts here. You've got other countries in Asia that say, hold on just a second, let's figure out how safe it is. Yeah. You let that innovation move forward first. So y usually, um, yeah, so the, the, the current state of the regulation, uh, just to, to, to put it clear, is that uh, right now we can use commercial drones uh, in visual line of sight in restricted areas. So that's basically uh, what is in vigor in every country in the world, um, like uh, with uh, variation, uh, small variations. So what we want ultimately is to be able to fly drones wherever uh, and, um, and, and for them to be able to penetrate the, the, the controlled airspace and to interact with other uh, uh, airships or, or airplanes 
to, uh, to, to um, avoid uh, collisions and, uh, and avoid danger. So um, indeed, uh, one way, I mean, the, the pressure is coming from the, from the market, the, from, from the usage and from the, the customer who wants that, that technology to evolve. And this is the pressure that, is, uh, that the, the regulators feel. Uh, and indeed, uh, sh uh, showcasing is a, is a great way to have uh, that evolution uh, like uh, engaged and, and, and pushed. So uh, indeed, there is uh, various ways uh, governments react uh, to, to showcases. There are uh, governments which are, which are very eager to, to experiment and that will you know, provide uh, derogations um, and uh, like, permi like occasional permissions to operate in particular conditions as long as we uh, demonstrate that it's, it's safe in terms of, of risk. So there is that approach in many countries in the world. Uh, probably I would say China is one of, of these. And there is another approach which, which is, which is a very, uh, let's say, risk, uh, uh, risk uh, adverse and which say, uh, well, while, while uh, you're not authorized to do it, uh, you just don't and you, you wait for a regulation to, to exist. So uh, there, there's one regulation, which is obviously kind of what we've addressed, which is to make sure that uh, these drones could fly alongside each other without crashing into each other. There's the other bit, which is um, some of the other stranders and practices that need to be addressed, uh, data security being really at the heart of it. Um, Sonia, what do you think is, is the key piece here that needs to be addressed on, on the security front, and what is the solution as you see it? Well, I, I believe there's no global solution. From, that's my point of view, from my work. I think, you know, even not just about the data security, but about regulations in general, I think each country needs to understand how drones can apply in their country. And I think this is what is missing today in a lot of countries that I work in, is to have local, local examples just of using drones for, for delivery, for data. Even when you deliver, you still create a lot of data. So I think it's to take all of this into consideration and to discuss it at a local level with the policymakers. And to include, it includes not only the civil aviation authorities, it also includes Homeland Security. It, you know, it includes a lot of different actors locally to look at this holistically. Because I, I believe that if we now, you know, we, like, we, we will address the just pure regulations on how to fly. This will, okay, s s solve, a, solve a current issue, but very soon there's gonna come the next wave, which is gonna be about the data and ethics and, and that use, and I believe we should you know, look at this in a more holistic way. And I mean, Lokesh put it in a very good way, uh, having sandboxes or whatever you would want to call them in countries, bringing in the different stakeholders. So bringing in the different ministries who can take advantage of these technologies, of the data that is produced, of the merchandise, urgent merchandise that can be delivered in countries. Again, if I take Nepal, you know, roads are difficult. So to be able to deliver vaccines or to deliver uh, blood samples or even spit samples, you know, to get uh, something back and forth and get medicine back. It's really interesting, but you also create data. So even there, I think to take into consideration both the flying, but also the data in a very, not global approach, but a very local approach. And where that I think the global part can come in is a lot of countries will have questions how others do it. So to create this global council, that helps countries to talk to each other, to address you know, their issues, their, their fears, their successes, and to share. And I think by sharing, then countries will overcome their, their personal challenges or fears that they might have a system by talking to others and learning and sharing from them. Jana, do you wanna weigh in on that in terms of how you think that the data security side of things should be? Crafted. Should it really be a kind of a fragmented approach where each country addresses their own issues when it comes to privacy? I think it's a, I mean, if we're referring more to data privacy, I think it's the, the debate you see today with the big tech companies that, you know, the debate that's going on with Google, with Facebook. I mean, it's the same debate that we would have, and that's really centered around data privacy, and it will be interesting to see how they tackle and solve that problem because we can probably learn from what already the big tech companies are going through. So I don't think it will be anything new. Uh, whether there's going to be a, uh, an all-encompassing solution, globally speaking, um, I'm not so sure. I think um, managing data is um, very closely linked to a country. I mean, if I look at a country like Germany, 
um, where I'm from, I mean, we have extremely uh, strict uh, data privacy rules that I think um, other countries would have um, um, not such stringent rules. So I think it would be very difficult to go over a sovereignty of a, uh, of a country in terms of data privacy. Um, I think as, a, as industry, we have, a, we have a duty to our customers mm -hmm. to ensure that we uh, protect and ensure data privacy. And this is certainly something that not only we, but certainly many other companies will need to um, give that insura assurance to our customers if we want to be successful in business. So I mean, we will tackle that. Uh, the other topic is in um, data security, which I understand more of how do we protect drones from being um, potentially um, uh, taken over by negative forces, so to say. Uh, and this again is uh, for industry, is when we are designing and developing these systems, it's clear from the beginning, we need to design them in such a robust manner mm. to prevent that actually from happening. And that's a, a huge growing industry as well, um, is to protect drones from these negative, uh, potential negative takeovers, uh, so to say. So the conversation with regulators need, needs to, ma maybe it sounds like you're saying it needs to happen a little sooner before the actual drones are developed. In terms of data security, I mean, I, honestly, in the aeronautical business, all our products that we designed already designed that in as an essential ingredient of the design process. So I would say for us, it's not something that we think about. It's a, it's a given. It's an automatic. So, I mean, we do that. I, mean, I think there's a difference between um, when you're designing um, drones for consumer use or drones for enterprise. Uh, I think there is a difference. I mean, it's, it's, it's cost-driven. I mean, when you're building very um, uh, low-cost drones, you're not going to be spending ex absorbent amounts of money in, in, in trying to secure those drones. So I, I think you can hack into a lot of the, um, many of the drones, consumer drones that are on the market today. Maybe regulations will be put into place. But again, as we mentioned, it's the, the continual struggle between innovation and um, regulations to lead to safety uh, and security. I want to see if we can open up the discussion to, to the audience as well while we're on the topic of regulation. Um, do we have a mic that can maybe go around? Any any questions? We'll start over here. Do we have a mic? just want to weigh in with another example. Um, we're using drones to deliver blood um, in Rwanda, um, initially half of the country just now going to the full country. And regulations have been set up for Rwanda because there the airspace issues are much less and it's been much less of a challenge. Lots of air flying now and, and getting experience. What's interesting is there has been huge demand from other countries. So I run Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and provide vaccines for um, most of the poor countries, and we've seen now country after country step up. The good news on the regulation side is that the Fourth Industrial Revolution set up a project to do work on regulation on drones using the Rwanda experience and coming up with a standard policy that could be adapted. Obviously, it's not the same in every country, but adapted for other countries using Rwanda's experience. And so now, as we're beginning to roll this business out, not just for, for blood, but for other uh, commodities in other countries, there is a standardized um, a way of doing that. And it's interesting because it's driving interest in the West, where initially the regulatory barriers were very high, but now that they're seeing successful use case, that is um, you know, driving it forward. So we're seeing a case where developing nations are sort of setting the standard for uh, the more developed nations. Um, did you want to weigh in on this at all? No, okay, no, great. No, uh, I know you had a question right there. Hi, so I'm Karuna, Global Shaper from Mauritius. Uh, my question has to do with the use of drones in marine environments. I know they're starting to be used and being used, um, for example, to tackle the issue of plastic pollution or even take pictures of, wide li of marine um, um, underneath life. And now my question is, um, are there regulations on the safe use of drones in marine environments, um, be it flying over marine environments or, in s or underneath? Yeah. Thanks. Who would like to take that? So, yeah, like uh, pretty much everywhere else, it, it, those regulations exist but are incomplete. 
So uh, what I can say to ma make it, you, you know, it's, it's fragmented, as we said, depending on the, uh, on the geographic location, depends uh, on, on the country, depends on the zone, depends on, uh, but, but if you take a, like a step back and, and try to sum it up, uh, you can say that it's, um, I mean, it's not really regulated to fly overseas, and, and, uh, but it's simpler to get uh, derogation for, from, uh, from uh, uh, aviation authorities uh, locally because, of course, you're above the sea, so uh, the risk is, uh, is a lot lesser, you know, to, uh, to damage anything or, or, uh, or to, to, to hurt people, let's say. So, um, yeah, that, that's still uh, an area that needs to be, uh, to be filled, and that's something that, uh, I mean, uh, in the drone community, uh, the, uh, all, all the stakeholders ha has to have to work on to, uh, to, to make it happen. Any other questions? Uh, hi, my name is Anas Dahlawi. I'm from Falcon Viz. It's a drone company based in Saudi Arabia. So just uh, answering to the lady, basically, uh, uh, as you mentioned, regulations is not clear in a lot of countries still are developing. Uh, we are getting some exceptions. So I guess a lot of uh, development countries are working on exceptions until the regulations is set. Uh, as well, the type of applications using the drones. It's like you have a mobile ab applications, but you can put a lot of apps on it. So it depends what, what kind of use you want to do. It's like, is it environmental studies? Is it terrain mapping? So uh, this is just a comment I just want to add. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's talk about, uh, uh, did we have one? Oh, we have one in the back. So uh, how do you assess the, uh, the um, safety issues when you are flying over the heavily uh, populated area? So is it ever going to be a reality or, or just um, you just have to avoid it because of the danger? of the drones when it falls, falls out of the sky. How I'm not sure if I caught the, the last, the second half of that. You said, how do we address the safety issue yeah, in a urban, populated urban, area? Yeah, urban, urban areas. So. Technologically possible, right? You can do it today, but um, can you, is there any way to have mitigate the uh, risk to fly over the drones over there? Is so it ever be possible? Rwanda case, you know, it's uh, nothing there. I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, the population is really heavy. And what I've understood under the Rwanda case, what, um, they are taking a, a low-risk approach in the sense of focusing more on rural and not actually you know, going into the urban areas. I think um, flying in urban areas today, I'm not convinced that we have secure enough systems in place for that. I mean, I would be taking more the approach to build up that body of evidence, to build up that um, body of experience that we need to have that feedback cycle understanding how, you know, if a drone crashes, why did the drone crash? How can we avoid that? I think there is work to be done. One of my biggest fears is that someone does fly um, uncontrolled in an urban space mm -hmm. or um, endangers um, an airplane in flight, uh, take off and landing at an airport, that will put this industry back significantly. And I think one should really strive for us, I know, we're all putting pressure and we want to find solutions and we want to uh, get the regulations done, but it doesn't help us to be rash. Uh, it doesn't help us if a drone actually hurts, significantly hurts someone by uh, dropping out of the sky. Um, it will really, really throw the progress we've done backwards. It will make people very nervous. It could um, have a, a backlash from the public as well. So I think we need to be we need to feel, have a very high level of confidence mm -hmm. in the security of those drones before we start putting them in, I would say, heavily populated areas, would be my uh, point of view. Uh, let me press on that. Po oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, to, uh, to understand your question, I mean, you're, there, there's many ways of assessing risk, and, but maybe we can distinguish be between two philosophies. The first one would be to, to meet uh, the standards of standard aviation and to uh, reach the failure rates uh, that are uh, in vigor on the, on the manned planes. 
which is very hard because I mean uh, aviation has a, a long history and uh, and is particularly efficient in uh, in reducing the the risks. And there is another approach which is a little bit more uh, hands-on, which is to come to, uh, to 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 do a risk-based ana analysis to uh, list all the possible problems that could happen during a, a flight, and and that depends on many things. It depends on the technology, on the on the on the on the zone you're you're flying above. Uh, on the it depends on the like the density of the traffic that is uh, in that in that space. And, and make uh, like a, a customized risk, uh, risk assessment. And this is more uh, the approach we'd like to, uh, to favor or to, to, uh, to push because uh, it gives more, uh, more flexibility uh, to, uh, well, to, uh, to, to just uh, fly drones. You know, if the, if the probability of a risk is, is acceptable, then it's, it's safe to fly. So, so let me press on that point um, because there's, hobby drones are one thing, but if we're talking about the use of drones in, in a populated area. We've heard a lot of uh, companies like Amazon, Alibaba here, do their own test cases on delivery drones. As you look to, to the safety aspects and sort of the basics that need to be in place in order for this to be used on a wide scale, is it the, the technology right now, Yana, that you're referring to that maybe some questions on? Is it about just having the regulation in, in place so that they can all coexist with each other? What's the biggest concern when it comes to the safety side of things? I mean, to be quite honest, we can build safe drones. Mm -hmm. We can build those drones to the 10 minus 9, so uh, to standards that you have in manned aviation today. That drone will be the most expensive drone you've ever seen in the commercial space, and you will never, ever do a business with it. And this is a challenge we are facing, because we simply we cannot have drones certified to that level for, that, um, for those smaller drones. Um, and that's why I'm a, I think... Flying in that urban space, we may need to have different drones than what we see today um, that are, however, economically viable. I mean, certainly when you go into the larger um, drones and when you talk about personal transport, they will definitely be certified. And they will be certified to the level of uh, almost what we see um, with manned aircraft today because we will have, you're not going to want to have 700 kilograms dropping on you from the sky, that's for sure, and we're transporting human beings. So I think as industry, we, we're really caught in the struggle saying, yes, we know how to certify these drones. Yes, we know how to make them safe, or we know it's not going to fall out of the sky. Um, but we know that that's not going to be a business case. Mm -hmm. We will never, ever be able to make a business case of smaller drones that are certified to very high standards today. Mm -hmm. So cost certainly uh, one of the hurdles there. Uh, what are some of the other hurdles um, that you see kind of holding back this technology from being used on a wide scale. Um, you know, Sonia, you and I were talking yesterday about ba battery issues um, and uh, questions about just how quickly some of the data can be uploaded as well. What do you see as the, the biggest technological challenges right now? So in the environment we work, the technological uh, challenges are definitely battery life. They're also battery charging. A lot of times, you know, it, electricity is not a commodity that is available everywhere. So you really have to think about how you charge your batteries. Uh, to have solar stations possibly to charge them. It's uh, one of the main issues we see today is also repair. You know, it's, it's, it's great to have the systems, but at one point they're going to need repair. So local repair, when you talk repair, you talk about spare parts. So how can you get spare parts? Can you 3D print spare parts? So it's all these kind of questions that really hold back, I think, the scaling of it is to say battery life, it, it's data. You produce massive amount of data. So just downloading data, processing data is not as easy. You know, it's, it seems easy in a lot of places, but then when you go to rural I just came back from rural Tanzania doing an agriculture project. In three days, you produce 200 gigabytes of data. You have to, already you have to recharge, you have to download your data. And then the real challenge that I really did not see, but that is an, an, a major challenge uh, that we have with uh, uh, the stakeholders we work with in, in Tanzania, for example, is then to transfer the data to the stakeholders. Uh, because the bandwidth is not there. Even you're not going to transfer the 200 gigabyte because you can transfer very high resolution maps. And then the next hurdle, like once you got over this one, because you can do a web service and you can easily share it, is for the stakeholders to actually read it. So for us, uh, actually the, the most pressing technical challenge today is a lot about how sharing the data and how educating the stakeholders to be able to analyze the data. So how to simplify the data to a point 
uh, that any kind of common stakeholders can uh, make a decision out of it. Because sharing highly uh, complex data with stakeholders who have never had this kind of data before is a challenge we did not see. So you, along the way, you know, when you do projects like that, along the way, like you fall into, okay, batteries, uh, repairs, spare parts, okay, that is solved. So now, okay, data, okay, well, let's solve it, you know, web services solved. Oh, then it's actually, oh, stakeholders, oh, they've never seen a high resolution map. So how can we break it down to them to say like, okay, like can AI help with making predictions to say, okay, 40% of this area is flooded or, you know, 30% of houses are in the disaster area. So it's all these kind of, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's a, and that's the interesting part about it too, because like you think you have solved something and then you come up across the next hurdle. But it, for me, it's what also makes this space so interesting because I think it, there's, we have so much to learn and you can only learn when you do. And I think it brings back to the point that Jana said, you know, about creating a body of evidence when it comes to safety. It's the same in the use cases. You can only learn all these kind of things if you do. If you cannot do, you will not learn. You will not meet these barriers and, and challenges. And this is what it makes it actually really interesting. Yeah. So another factor that uh, one might add to uh, like uh, that is hindering the, the adoption is it's it's not a technological one. It's more of an economical one. Right now, uh, drones are operating by operated by people, and this is uh, you know uh, stupid because they are supposed to be autonomous and flying robots and do do it on their their own. And right now, we have the obligation to to have some somebody behind to monitor uh, the behavior of the UAV and 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 you know safeguard uh, whatever is happening. So uh, whenever this is, is, is overpassed, whenever this, we don't have to do this anymore, uh, I mean, the, the operational costs are going to be decreased by uh, orders of magnitudes because right now the, the, the majority of the cost of the operating cost when you go on a job and you, you want to collect data is uh, the, the, the human effort that you put into it. And whenever this doesn't have to, to be anymore, uh, it will, you know, uh, Fasten uh, the. Uh, I mean, it will speed up the adoption uh, really, really uh, greatly. How does sustainability factor into all of this? You know, building out in a way that is sustainable, environmentally friendly. Um, uh, Lakesh, do you want to take on that question in terms of, you know, when you think about the, the uses and where things are going, how much of that <laughs> that thinking plays into? I think given the technology is at its very nascent stage, I think our ability to really understand the other aspects of uh, the entire ecosystem is quite small. Mm -hmm. So we really don't know what kind of an animal in some sense are we dealing with. So from my perspective, I think we have uh, at least a few more years to go mm -hmm. before, we can, before we can really understand uh, the entire life cycle mm -hmm. uh, of this uh, entire product. Before you know just how? We, I mean, at this juncture, we really don't know. So, I mean, we know in bits and pieces, but to know the entire life cycle of a product, I think, given that it's, it's, it's in its such nascent stage, I think it's very difficult to really map out the entire life cycle. And that's the way we're viewing it. Mm -hmm. Yana, how does sustainability factor into um, your thinking as you look to expand this business? I mean, from an environmental perspective, I think everyone's really keen on electrification. Um, and everyone's focusing very strongly on how we can um, have batteries that are sufficient enough to fly um, certain distances or carry um, certain weights or have uh, certain charging speeds, speeds as well. Um, on the downside of that, we, we need to also not end up with a, a mountain of old batteries lying around. So I think it's a, we need to solve two problems at the same time. We need very efficient batteries, which is really good for the environment with electrification. But on the other hand, we also need to be able to dispose of these batteries in a manner that's also environmentally friendly. So I think uh, we kind of have a double challenge that we need to solve there. Um, I mean, there are also other alternative energies. Uh, we work a lot with solar-powered drones as well, so just using the sun. Um, and that's one of, I would say, um, one of our key projects that we have at Airbus is really how to provide um, a service um, to humanity for internet connectivity but doing uh, it completely driven by the power of the sun. 
Uh, and here we have a very strong focus in on, on environment, um, at the same time really reaching people who are today, millions of people who are not connected in the world. And I think that's when you have the true combination of sustainability, but also you know, reaching out to uh, unconnected people and making sure that they not um, stuck on an island somewhere <laughs> <laughs> uh, and not connected to the rest of what's happening in the world. Yeah, that would not be a good situation. I want to see if we can uh, open it up to any other questions here before we kind of move into the next phase of the discussion. Yes, coming back to, to the topic of batteries, uh, making the batteries more lightweight is also another way to increase the energy density of batteries. You can carry more of them. Uh, is any R&D done by your industry to make uh, better batteries and you partner up with the car industry, for example? Yes, sir, uh, we have a quite a strong focus on uh, battery when I was referring to the solar powered um, air vehicles that we fly. We, we partner with a variety of battery manufacturers, most of them actually being quite small boutique startup uh, battery companies. And we try and work with, um, with at least three companies um, simultaneously. And we are very strongly together with uh, what someone would think is our competitor. But together, although we may compete at an air vehicle level, we work together to stimulate the battery um, uh, ecosystem. And I think uh, we do need competition there to really push for investment in batteries. But it's something that we have a very clear understanding of what our battery needs are, uh, but we are not a battery manufacturer. And we just look for very close partnerships uh, together with, um, I would say, very specialist battery uh, companies and startups. Again, my name is Anas. Uh, I have a question regarding the future of drones. Where do you see the drones? Is it more in the, into the uh, hardware, software, more into the data analysis or AI? So where do you see that? It's it's open question. So uh, in, in my area, which is remote sensing, uh, uh, as we said, you know, the technology is quite, you know, it's quite uh, advanced or, I mean, can, it could be a, uh, improved, you know, uh, you, you could improve the, the performances, the, the data quality that you acquire on the field, and so on. But right now we have a working, working uh, solutions that, you know, provide uh, like quality data that you can work on. And the, 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 the added value tends to shift on the, on the software part of, of, of the business. And, you know, uh, uh, a software that is going to be able to extract the useful information out of these masses of data that you collect on the field, be able to deliver uh, useful information to your customers, be able to build digital twins of infrastructures that you will update, you know, with the with, uh, with heter heterogeneous data that you collect on the field by the means of, of drones or other techniques like a mix uh, with uh, satellites or IoT data. So this is, uh, in my opinion, the future at least of, of remote sensing, which is of course uh, a small fraction of the, of the whole uh, drone market, but, uh, but, but, but the one that is uh, currently, uh, let's say, uh, mature. I think if I look towards um, cargo and the personal transport, I think what's very illustrative to me is when people are looking at building new cities. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a case, if you look at Saudi, looking at uh, the vision of NEOM. And what I find so interesting is that they had such a strong focus on mobility, where they're looking to totally eliminate having any fossil fuel driven um, cars or, or anything to be completely electrified and then from the beginning to actually build into that basic infrastructure the ability to have flying taxis and the ability to do cargo drone delivery. And when that discussion starts becoming the norm in terms of city planning, when we're now building new cities, because I mean when we have old infrastructure and old cities, this is, it's difficult for us to introduce that kind of technology. But when that discussion becomes the norm, that is to me what the future is then of drones. Yesterday I attended a session on uh, how 5G is going to revolutionize mobility, etc. I was just wondering how it's going to affect the drone industry, especially from the points of view of the different challenges discussed today, um, like sa sa safety, security, efficiency, and things like that. So any thoughts on that? How 5G is going to revolutionize mm. drones? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, there was a very interesting session on 5G yesterday, uh, which I was listening into. I think 5G um, 
is absolutely an ins essential ingredient of when we're thinking of the fourth industrial revolution, we're thinking about autonomous cars, we're thinking about how to employ en masse drone fleets, because really it's with 5G that you're gonna get that uh, driving the latency down, which is absolutely key, especially in autonomous driving. Um, securing data, that's really where you have extremely high levels of uh, securing that data. Um, so uh, you also, uh, the clearly you have the speed that's also uh, linked to that and the ability to to link to what we mentioned with our IoT, that we can link to so many different sensors at the same time, that I think it's going to be absolutely transform. It's a, it's a, it's not even transformation. It's a, it's a key ingredient to really fully realizing. Um, I would say our aspirations of, of what we think um, the future of drones could be in terms of personal transport or also in terms of uh, autonomous cars. What do, you, what do you see, you know, we talk a lot about IoT and just connected devices um, accelerated by 5G. I mean, where, where, what is the role in, in, for the drone in, in that infrastructure ecosystem, if you will? You kind of laid that out there, but anybody else want to tackle that? Sure, so uh, ba basically it's the question of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a UAV system to be auto-sufficient or uh, it also can use uh, external uh, infrastructures to its, uh, uh, you know, to, to communicate or, or do whatever. And you know, it, it's funny because uh, in the history of uh, aviation, at some point uh, when pl planes were getting bigger, uh, they were landing on the water, you know, because there was no uh, uh, landing, landing strips uh, big enough to, to, uh, to uh, let, let's say, to, to, to land them. And everybody were, was saying, okay, the, the infrastructure will, ne will never develop uh, fast enough for uh, land airplanes to, to, to exist. And well, that's what just happened. So yeah, I strongly believe that uh, I mean, external infrastructure should be used uh, to uh, well to fly drones. If he had a microphone on a drone, he wouldn't have to run around. <laughs> um, to me, one of the absolute killer apps for me would be in war zones. And the idea would be if you're in Syria, if you're in Yemen now, you can get supplies across. And obviously, if a drone gets lost with supplies, it's not the same as sending a car and having it be attacked. Of course, the fear that sits behind that is the day a rebel takes the drone in that setting with a, you know, a bomb in it or explosive device or something, it affects the whole thing. I, I mean, is there an answer to that? Have people thought about that? Because obviously this could today solve a major, major yeah. problem, but the risks of affecting the, you know, an industry going forward would be dramatic. Yeah, Sonia, I wonder if you want to pick up that, because you talked about the trust issue, um, especially in, in developing countries, and, and, and you're using Warzone as an example. You said it just takes one, one drone that's used in a wrong way to, to really destroy the trust that's there, and then you have to rebuild again, preventing you from getting the aid in. Yeah, and I think that's the, you know, that's not just our fear. I think that's a fear of everybody in the industry to say, like, any one kind of, one bad example will take, like, a hundred, if not a thousand good examples to make up. And it's unfortunate to see that, you know, and it's normal, media talks a lot about the bad examples and not the good ones. There might be a thousand good examples out there to make up for it, but nobody wants to talk about it. So I think it's, and these are all the kind of issues that we, that we face. So for example, for us, for V Robotics, we don't do today any operations in conflict zones because conflict zones and drones, it's, it's a trust issue and, and everybody can understand why it's a trust issue, I guess. So I think a lot of education has to be done to overcome you know, these fears. Uh, I just had a very interesting lunch discussion with, with, you know, with two ladies talking about why drones are not used in, 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 uh, in, in camps for, for immigrants where it would make a lot of sense because these are moving cities. So to have, you know, like a monthly mapping of these moving cities to know where is what and what can happen where would make a lot of sense, but it's a trust issue. So and I think the only way you can work on trust is by educating. So I think that comes to me again to the point where today I think a lot of education is needed of any kind of stakeholders and a lot of uh, mm -hmm. responsible use and that can be done by giving some standards when it comes to using drones responsibly, not in, I would say, in the professional point, but in, in countries where there's a lot of civil use and, and consumer use of drones too. 
So I think this is what our industry in, in general and drones have to battle with a lot is the fear of just somebody crazily flying a drone next to an airport and crashing into a plane or you know, having an idea of using it as, as a weapon in one way or another. And the sad thing is always to kind of see is these kind of things happen with other things than drones, but it's not that mediatized. It's just the way that it is with drones. I mean, you know, cars can be used for many things. Most people would think, you know, a car is here to bring me from A to B or to transport something, uh, but they can be used in many ways. So we have this discussion with drones that we don't have with cars. But I think for, for us, it's really, it's about education. And I think the more we can talk about the good examples also and show good examples, the more people will have understanding. And with this comes the trust. I'd also like to add here, right. This is the challenge that 4IR has. Drones is just part of this ecosystem. You're going to keep having this question again and again. What if someone hacks into the IoT device that's giving feedback on health parameters, for example? And then the doctor gives the right, wrong diagnosis. We have this challenge. So actually, in one of the discussion early on um, before the session, we're talking about like the uh, circuit breaker that we have for electricity, right, at every home or every factory. Is there something that we could come about, which is on blockchain, and that can provide a secure en environment for 4AR technology? So I think given where we are today and 4AR, the nascency in which the entire ecosystem is in, I think there will be standards or, you know, or publications that will come about mm. and discoveries that will happen in that space. Any other questions? So let's talk about, um, I know our, our uh, question, uh, we got a question about the, the future of where things were headed uh, in drones, but I wonder if you've already kind of raised blockchain as one example, but what is the technology you think that will help advance this vision um, to, to where, where you see uh, drones being utilized. Um, what do you see is, is the biggest piece here that will accelerate things? I think more and more adoption is on its way. Mm. So I think you know, drones is going to be a way of life. It's no longer science fiction. From transporting blood to transporting even I mean, human beings, it's going to be a reality soon. I think as we discussed on the panel, uh, panel I think uh, battery endurance is going to be very, very critical. And our ability to do uh, you know, long distance is going to play a very important role. Mm. So that's when I think adoption will really come into the next level. Because the, in, in government, the biggest challenge we struggle is, okay, the drone goes in, has to come back, swap the battery again, again go in, come back. You're losing a lot of time. You're losing a lot of uh, you know, manpower time. And that's expensive and precious. So that's where I think battery endurance will play a very, very critical role in revolutionizing the space. Um, from my perspective, um, saying it, we're starting to look at um, a lot more when employees also artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Because one of the aspects um, to really scale up the use of drones, I mean, the one aspect is how do we manage all this data, which we've already addressed. We need to employ machine learning. Without machine learning, we will never be able to scale uh, this business from a, a remote sensing perspective. And on the other hand, we've addressed this as well, we will be moving away from one pilot, one drone, to the point that we will have operational centers mm -hmm. managing hundreds of drones, literally flying in very close proximity to one another. We will need AI to manage that, because uh, a human being will not be able to manage that amount of air traffic, what we see today. So I think with, um, without having sophisticated AI, we will not be able to scale that business. And I think this is one of the, from a technology perspective, something that uh, we're looking very closely at. It's, it's something that we believe is a key uh, to scaling the business um, and also uh, ensuring um, uh, the safety of those drones flying, um, multiple drones in uh, very confined areas with each other. Michael, you want to pick up on that point? We talk about swarms or... Swarms, yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, of course, um, I mean, uh, that's... Uh, so, we are talking about the, the question is uh, technology to, to, to make, like, the future happen. Uh, so, let's say uh, I agree with, with both, of course. Uh, and uh, so, energy on board and the ability to, to manage those uh, big fleets and those big traffic. Uh, so, in, in a more uh, immediate, I like a more immediate need would be, uh, you know, those two building blocks. Uh, the one, um, you know, the, to, to like give uh, a, a single UAV the ability to, to uh, see and avoid 
other uh, flying objects. So this is a, a paradigm that should be, uh, you know, developed still and that is still really uh, unsolved. And the second one is the ABG, and this is more of a, it's, it's a lot more simple. It's just, uh, you know, a standard to find and conventions to be made. But the ability to be to, uh, for, for uh, UAVs to be able to discuss uh, between each other and, you know, uh, uh, declare their position uh, in, the airspace, in the airspace for uh, uh, the air traffic management to handle them and to be able to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, organize them in a, in a global uh, movement. So that would be uh, two, two building blocks that are immediately necessary to, to, to move forward. So you, you've talked about um, the difference in, in applications between the north and the south, if you want to divide how we see the world here. Um, looking as somebody who is looking for use cases in developing nations, how do you increasingly get the interest on board uh, in some countries that are not on the radar right now? I think it's by creating these local examples that then can you know, go across borders to neighboring countries. Uh, because I really believe scaling in terms of, of space, so in, in uh, bringing these technologies to the global south, as we call it, the best way we see is really by creating examples that uh, stakeholders, governments can relate to. And it's very easy for somebody, for example, from Tanzania, to relate to something that happens in Rwanda or for somebody in Malawi to uh, you know, look what is happening in Tanzania. And I think it's the same with India, you know, like the neighbors or even in India, the different states, uh, I think by itself is by, by having examples that are locally applicable and that make sense locally, that address local needs and not just some generic needs. And by sharing these examples regionally, I think is the way to really scale it throughout the global south also quite fast. I think we just have a few minutes left. I'd love to do one last call for questions, if you've got any, uh, before we wrap things up. Okay, great. Well, I know our panelists will probably stick around for a few more minutes, or, okay, got one more. <laughs> With the um, commercialization of the drones, and uh, so, we see money to be channeled into drone technology where you know drones themselves are not much differentiation between them and probably they are com becoming a commodity. Where do you see room for VC that you know they can gain the investment that is needed into the applications of drones? What area? That's right. right. So uh, I, I agree with you, uh, drone, uh, drones are you know, small drones, I'd say, uh, tends to become a commodity. Uh, but, so we've seen that, you know, in the commercial market uh, where uh, DJI drones uh, became like the standard and, uh, you know, uh, are now available at very uh, low price and can do a number of tasks, like an incredible number of tasks uh, in a very good uh, manner. Uh, there is uh, also uh, a need for, uh, like, uh, more, um, more niche hardwares, you know, uh, there, there is a value in, uh, in premium hardware that can do particular tasks like um, capturing very high quality data or qu capturing data with a very high accuracy or a geo, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the fact to be, I mean, a very, very strong accuracy that are sometimes necessary you know, for particular applications. So today uh, that hardware has a value that is not really addressed by, uh, by consumer drones and, and hence there is, a, uh, well, uh, some, some uh, money to be made in those, uh, in those niche areas that are not really mainstream yet. Uh, then I agree with you in some, in some you know, period of time, maybe five, maybe 10 years, uh, the hardware will, be, will get commoditized more and more. And, but, but then the, the value shifts uh, towards the, the ability to process the data. And right now, uh, data processing and you know, platforms you know, that uh, provide uh, analytic suites to, uh, to analyze automatically the, the, the masses of data that are collected on the fields are uh, a, a, big, uh, a big hype in the, in the VC market. And uh, I guess that's, the, that's where the, the, the money is uh, actually right now. That wraps up our session here. Uh, really appreciate you all joining us. Thank you to our panelists as well. <laughs>